You, me, and HIFMB. Stories of science and the sea. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. I'm Jan Klaas Dijker, a postdoc working at HIFMB. And in this episode, I talk to Ravi Ranjan from India, a community ecologist. And he, his, his main forte is building uh, models of, of competition. So when species interact and compete for different resources, he, he models that. And uh, we talked about the, the history of these models and how these models moved from pretty much two species models where only two species compete to very complex models where it's like 500 of them. And uh, Ravi has, has worked on various steps through this process of getting m more complex and interestingly actually worked on on blogging about uh, COVID-19 models as well and making what they do more approachable so actually explaining that in science communication and Ravi is a is a postdoc here at HIFMB working on phytoplankton and he has done his PhD in Michigan at uh, Michigan State University And also, interestingly enough, worked on snow leopards. So we talk about uh, snow leopards, we talk about uh, COVID-19 models, we could talk about phytoplankton models, uh, model history, maths. It's a super interesting uh, talk and I'll give you Ravi Ranjan. Welcome to the next episode of the HFMB podcast. And today I have Ravi Ranjan. From from India. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This yeah. is uh, wonderful. I've never been on a podcast before. So this uh, is my first time. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so, so you're a uh, community ecologist. Yes. Right. And, yeah. and that is yeah. my identity. Well, that is my scientific identity, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. You and and how, yeah. How, how did you get into that? Because I saw in your in your CV that you didn't start out doing that. How did you make the, the shift? Right. So I really started out actually quite differently i was mm -hmm. doing engineering yeah um and that's where i started out and that to like manufacturing engineering so trying to understand like uh, trying to learn how to like you know run manufacturing plants and uh, like uh, industrial plants basically mm -hmm. but uh over time i basically uh i also had a master's degree uh together it's like an integrated program and it was like an interesting program where you do like this bachelor's in engineering and a master's in science mm -hmm. and uh So I was doing my master's in biology and uh, bachelor's in uh, manufacturing engineering. Uh, But uh, yes. the biology part was always more appealing. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> How come? Like, what is it? I mean, so I don't know. I mean, it's engineering can be a little bit dry. It can be actually really interesting as well. But I, I don't know. I just, I, it, some of it is, I think, chance. Mm -hmm. Because what you encounter at what times and, you know, you find like a good teacher who is explaining something and then it captures your imagination. Yeah. versus um yeah so i think at that point i was finding engineering fairly dry mm -hmm. um and uh, not as intriguing and then what happened was i uh, ended up in uh, doing an internship uh, mm -hmm. in a biology lab and that was an empirical lab as opposed to the theoretical work that i do now yeah but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll get into that in a second <laughs> yes yeah but essentially uh, what happened i i, I I was there, we were working uh, with uh, these mosquitoes mm -hmm. and Aedes aegypti. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so these were real life mosquitoes, yeah. but rather they're larvae. We were working with the larvae mm -hmm. most of the time, mm -hmm. and larvae and pupae. So just for context, these mosquitoes, I mean, we see them uh, as adults, but of course uh, they have three other life stages, which yes. are in the water. So there is uh, larvae and then uh, pupae, well, an eggs, larvae, and then pupae. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, the question there was to try and understand, like, how the presence or absence of uh, predator cues. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I mean, a lot of things eat these larvae when they are in the water. Yeah. So there are dragonfly names, there are guppies, like fish, and yeah. stuff yeah. like that. So, and just their presence releases probably cues, like chemical cues in mm -hmm. the water. And we were trying to see... Well, uh, the grad student there was trying to see how the presence or absence of those cues, what what that does to the pup the rate at which these larvae grow. Mm -hmm. So maybe if the predator, the I essential idea being if the predators are present, then maybe you want to get out of the water faster. Yeah. Right? Because uh, <laughs> safety in the air. <laughs> you <don't laughs> get, yes. You don't want to get eaten. But on the other hand, if you get out of the water faster, then you have like, uh, you'll get less time to like uh, grab nutrients from the water and mm -hmm. grow more. So mm -hmm. that might have sort of consequences for you later yep. on in your life. So this is 
sort of classic trade off and then that then captured your attention uh, no away. so that that did so that's the thing so that uh, so i i really got into these like, so, like this was my sort of introduction to ecology and biology mm-hmm. uh like experimental work yeah and um, and that really like like the questions really grabbed me mm-hmm. not the <laughs> experiments per se yeah but, right okay okay <laughs> <laughs> but the questions were really interesting so that's how i sort of got into it and then i came back for another summer and then um eventually i was like i decided that the experiments are not for me because yeah no for me neither <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's rough uh yes. <laughs> half of the time they, I mean, they keep failing so often and mm-hmm. then you have to standardize all these things and pi- like do pilot experiments and this and that and yeah. which all you know mad respect to people who actually do them absolutely yeah but uh, <laughs> i cannot <laughs> no, no, me neither. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's still a long answer to your question. Yeah, but, exactly. And yeah. and then so, so the the questions yes. kind of captured your attention, yes. and and yeah. that's how you moved into theoretical ecology. Yeah. Basically, I decided after the, my like second internship uh, that um, you know I had some math training because of my engineering background, mm-hmm. and um, it, which could be applied. And I sort of discovered this whole field of sort of people doing theoretical biology mm-hmm. across. different scales like uh, i mean people doing genetics and theoretical biology ecology and theoretical biology like all sorts of things yeah so um yeah so i thought you know i understand some calculus <laughs> i can <laughs> maybe may, maybe do something here instead and i mean that sort of help uh, keeps me in the realm of the question so i can and it keeps me interested i mean keeps me working with these concepts and these ideas mm-hmm. uh, of you know how life works and uh, at, and and i don't have to like you know get my hands dirty <laughs> yeah exactly yes yeah in in the the intro like the the intro to your thesis is really good and and really really uh, engaging and you you really engagingly write about the history of of uh-huh. uh competition and and models of competition yes. if you could get into that that'd be yeah. brilliant yeah yeah of course so i sort of um when i got into doing theory i basically I don't know through a matter of accident I, maybe but uh, I got into like community ecology which is essentially this study of like uh, communities of species living together and how they interact with each other and what that means for their uh, like abundance and things like that mm-hmm. and so one of the sort of primary interactions in uh, in communities across ecosystems across the world mm-hmm. literally any community of anything living anywhere yeah right is uh, competition mm-hmm. and so species of different species i mean you can pick your uh, favorite species uh, fish to like plants to whatever else yeah they are always competing for uh, resources mm-hmm. so like for example a good example might be like okay so there are phytoplankton living in the sea and mm-hmm. they uh, are always competing for nitrogen phosphorus and things like that so people started studying uh, communities by studying competition mm-hmm. almost for some complicated reasons i suppose i don't know but uh, <laughs> uh essentially the f- initial idea was that people make made these models uh, very very simple models uh, called like for example the earliest one was the called is called the lord cavaltera model mm-hmm. of competition which essentially assumes that um you know you strip away a community of everything else mm-hmm. you imagine there are two species and there is nothing else in the world <laughs> and they are competing with each other yeah. and there is a uh, sort of uh, as one species grows it has sort of a linear effect on the growth rate of the other species mm-hmm. so like the more of species a the the less of species b mm-hmm. uh, at least the, the, yeah so the growth rate is negatively impacted mm-hmm. of species b so and that's a very sort of uh, it's like very boiled down mm-hmm. you know i mean of course there's a lot of complexity in the world but you have to start somewhere so yeah. that's where they started <laughs> and uh, and i mean so uh, to this day actually that model sort of remains foundational to our understanding of competition and the outcomes of competition and what we know about it mm-hmm. so that's where uh, that's where uh, uh, that's what uh, this whole field started i think mm-hmm. but then eventually what happened was that some people were dissatisfied with the amount of uh, sort of detail in the in the model which yeah makes sense because there is basically none yeah. uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> So um but so like a bunch of people started making more mechanistic models mm-hmm. so there is this sort of traditional divide between in, in models is more mechanism versus uh, what are called phenomenological models mm-hmm. so like uh, you in phenomenological models you sort of abstract away pretty much everything and you as much as you can like you 
focus on the bare bare basics right and okay. that's that's the idea like on the on the phenomenon yes of, exactly okay, okay yeah, yeah, right yeah so you're trying to capture the essence of competition as a phenomenon mm-hmm. and you're not you're not bothered about which species it's happening in where it is happening what they're competing for none of that is important you're right. just like they are competing that is what is important yeah right? okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so uh, but then uh, people were sort of more interested in like more detail and uh, um so like for example one of the prominent ones is this resource competition model from uh, david tillman and uh, what he did he adapted this economic theory mm-hmm. to ecology which essentially they're like oh, he was uh, he thought of two plants mm-hmm. or plankton for that matter yeah and uh, he imagined them competing for two resources like nitrogen and phosphorus and mm-hmm. so now he was explicitly accounting for like the details uh, of like for example what they are competing for mm-hmm. as opposed to the lot covered era where they're just competing yeah and you don't bother about what they're competing for mm-hmm. and then what that the advantage of doing that is uh it's a little bit more mechanism mm-hmm. it's a little bit more realistic yeah and you can then make predictions about oh so what happens if you have too much nitrogen mm-hmm. or what happens what happens if you have a lot of phosphorus and not as much nitrogen okay right and versus maybe they're balanced and you have these scenarios that you can play with mm-hmm. and you can then make predictions about okay so maybe if i have two species competing and i have a lot of nitrogen but not as much phosphorus then i i predict that species a will win the competition mm-hmm. as opposed to if you have too much phosphorus but not as much nitrogen maybe species b will win the competition yeah right but then really what most people are actually interested in is uh, uh, the idea of coexistence and when these two species are actually able to live with each other mm-hmm. so then you can try and find out some conditions on the resources okay so how much nitrogen versus phosphorus is required for these two to be able to live with, live with each other mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's sort of the more mechanistic uh, a little bit more mechanistic and then since then people have made i mean uh, now there are like thousands and thousands of models and yeah <laughs> <laughs> but those are sort of like the the milestones along the way but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. now meca- i mean and you can now do uh, people study networks of competition people study like with like yeah, hundreds exactly. of species and yeah yeah that's... exactly so so at at that stage we still had two species competing exactly. and, but yeah. but your gap now that you're filling is there's multiple species yeah so i actually so uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because uh, uh what happens is you can study so like two is the basic number you need for compete mm-hmm. to co- for competition to happen right like you, you yeah. can't have competition with one species yeah. right <laughs> so um so that's where everyone started mm-hmm. right but then as you add more and more species mm-hmm. and or for that matter any more co- any sort of complexity but as you add more and more species the math gets more and more difficult mm-hmm. to do mm-hmm. and then it gets harder to get a- action sort of interesting insights out of it like yeah. right like some simple condition that we can intuitively understand that yeah. becomes harder to get out of these models yeah so so there are people who do this one or two or three uh, sort of uh, sort of stuff and mm-hmm. i am usually one of them and then <laughs> there is uh, uh, there are people who do sort of more complicated stuff yeah uh, uh, with like networks and stuff and uh, so like you have like 100 species and then you're they're looking at like okay so if we take one out does the network collapse and things like that mm-hmm. um, yeah but uh, i was uh, trying to sort of uh, i think there is this gap in between mm-hmm. um uh, of like you know you you is it studying two or you're studying like 500 yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, so i was trying to sort of see uh what happens uh, with the two species models if you take one step further and so like study maybe three or four mm-hmm. uh, and how much complexity do we get in what do we learn that sort of stuff yeah right yeah so okay. th- one step forward but not like all the way there yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and and is this what you're doing now or this is what you did in your phd that, that's what i did my phd right yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah now um i am sort of more focused on uh, actually phytoplankton uh, more specific to phytoplankton mm-hmm. and trying to look at how they will respond to or their populations will respond to um re- uh, increasing temperatures mm-hmm. and at the same time as changing nutrients 
Is that the first time working with phytoplankton or? Uh, uh, <laughs> working with phytoplankton is an interesting phrase for a theoretician because yeah, right. I, really, I mean, even now I'm not actually I'm dealing with any phytoplankton in my hands. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so like at least one or uh, one chapter of my thesis was sort of inspired by phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was working in a lab, uh, which was a phytoplankton lab. Right. So Chris and Lena, my uh, supervisor, and uh, his wife, who's also a faculty, mm -hmm. um, uh, they uh, formed this like the the theoretical empirical team of uh, mm -hmm. people, and they their primary system is phytoplankton. And sometimes they deal with my, my um, other bacteria and stuff also. But yeah. But to you, that they're mostly just names, just species names, or, or what are they to you? Oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, so, so far they have mostly just been species names. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because I am more interested in the processes than, yeah. uh, than the details of the species. But I think that's uh, changing more now that I'm here. Uh, mm -hmm. Because now I am sort of thinking more about these more applied, slightly more applied questions. So this is all like very fairly fundamental stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about more about slightly more applied questions of like, for example, climate change and uh, yeah. things like that. And then you have to sort of think about them as real things. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> because now I have to I sort of get into their physiology and things like that and uh, grapple with, uh, you know, how they might change with temperature. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you have to think about it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, things, yeah. Uh -huh. Making your theory more applied. Exactly. It, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so so you you joined last year, right? In... I joined in May last year. Yes. Yeah. End of May. Yeah. So How's almost. it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's going. It's going pretty well. It's going pretty well. Uh, yeah. Took me some time to get settled, and uh, I mean, moving in countries in the middle of a pandemic is not fun. Oh yes. Do yeah. not recommend. No. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah so it took some time to get like you know paperwork sorted and then yeah uh, all of that and then i mean right after the phd and stuff and um but now i think i've sort of settled in mm -hmm. you know uh, so now now it's uh, i mean and you know the work you starting work with new people uh it takes time to like find a rhythm and yeah uh, yeah all of that so uh, but yeah now 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 it's going well i think yeah who's who's your group is that is that mainly helmut uh, so it's burned uh who's my primary actually uh mm -hmm. advisor uh Bernd, and Bernd. Bl Bernd blasius, ah, blasius yes. uh, yeah okay. uh and uh who does mathematical modeling mostly that's my yeah so the yeah, theory the, the tradition yeah. that's your backbone that's my backbone <laughs> exactly uh and then there is helmut um who is the phytoplankton sort of ecologist mm -hmm. uh, broadly um and uh, yeah so that's uh, the two of and then i also have a collaboration with uh, someone in uh, geneva mm -hmm. with uh thomas who and so the three of us well the four of us uh, yeah that's that's the team essentially sweet how, how did the person in geneva get involved oh um so i know him so he did his phd with elena mm -hmm. and uh, he's also working on simpler similar questions uh, so i mean i know him from before and he was already talking to helmut about some of sim uh, similar questions so there was already like uh, okay <laughs> this conversation is already happening and then i was you know looking <laughs> for a postdoc project and yeah yeah And then I was also interested in similar questions, so uh, it all came together essentially. Sweet, yeah, yeah, Sweet. a little bit of luck. And yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And and probably a bit of good networking. Yes, I mean, yeah, hope, yeah, that is that always helps, of yeah. course. Yeah, uh -huh. maybe to put a bit because we've jumped around in your timeline now. Maybe yeah. to put a bit yeah. of uh, structure to this. So, um, you, you're from India yes. originally, yes. and uh, yeah, where, where exactly? So I am uh, from the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is uh, translates to the northern state, and mm -hmm. it's India's most populous state. I think this is still true. I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure it's true. Um, and uh, it's how I like to tell people is overnight train ride away from Delhi, because Delhi right. is uh, sort of uh, something that people know. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, it's it's North India, and yeah, that's where I sort of grew up broadly mm -hmm. yeah, in the plains yeah and, and then for your bachelor's you moved to pilani correct yeah. uh that is to the west and sort of closer to the desert uh in india yeah and yeah and that's where i did my this this program that i described in the beginning yeah exactly the the mas the masters and the bachelors yeah the engineering and, and then the sciences yes. yeah okay yeah, yeah. and exactly so, so what was your um what was the masters called the the masters so program? it was Just masters of sciences in biological sciences. Okay. So very broad. Right. Yeah. And then after that, I sort of moved to uh, Bangalore, uh, mm -hmm. where 
So in India, a lot of like ecology research happens uh, prominently in the south in in Bangalore. Yeah, that's where I know m- most uh, Indian scientists from. Is, yeah, is yeah, I, there yeah. is. Uh, yeah, I mean now it's expanding, uh, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in ecology. Yeah, but I think the sort of there are like several institutes in in Bangalore which have a lot of ecologists and evolutionary biologists. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, so that's sort of. I mean that was the track I was headed on so yeah. I I went there and I was uh, that's also where I did my internships actually mm-hmm. so yeah. um, the, the one with the mosquitoes yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. yes okay. <laughs> the one with the mosquitoes uh, my friends still love that to this day <laughs> <laughs> that I was growing mosquitoes in beakers and <laughs> this is not a thing that uh, you know any non scientist ever uh, dreams about doing probably not no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you mosquitoes are meant for killing you know no not <laughs> and and then how did you make the, the uh, yeah right Right, so I, I I was in Bangalore, and I was uh, I that's where I did like I worked for like a year with a professor there, mm-hmm. and I did my so my master's thesis mm-hmm. actually, and they are they are my my the university allowed me to like go elsewhere and do it if like I found someone uh, that I really wanted to work with. Okay, which I did, and that's what I did in Bangalore, and then for a whole year, and uh, so that was the final year of my program, mm-hmm. and then I stayed one more year after that, mm-hmm. and get the paper out and like start yeah. some other things and yeah. also apply for PhDs mm-hmm. meanwhile too yeah and, yeah. Th- and that's why you applied for your PhD that you got in the end or yep that's yeah yeah I mean I applied for to a lot of places but yeah yeah all oh, same <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> you know how it is yeah and and then Michigan right yes. Michigan in the US yes Michigan in the US <laughs> the, the, there must have been a bit of change in climate <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yes <laughs> it certainly was I mean um it's uh, it's so funny until actually Germany um so I was when I was in uh, in in UP when I was growing up in mm-hmm. school the lowest temperature would go up to like what um I don't know like single digit uh, digit Celsius so like four or five on the coldest times yeah maybe um then I went to Pilani Mm-hmm. And then there, that's sort of closer to the desert, and it and it gets to like sometimes it gets to zero, mm-hmm. which was like a big deal uh. at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Michigan, and then the floor just dropped by like twenty degrees. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, does it get that cold? Yeah, yeah, it gets to like minus twenty, minus twenty five sometimes. I... In in it's sometimes like usually it's like around minus eight, minus nine. I think is fairly. Uh, pretty standard in like january february yeah right but yeah but if there's like a polar vortex which happened when i was there uh once uh that sounds wild i don't even know what that is <laughs> <laughs> you know it sounds yeah <laughs> it sounds it sounds like yeah it sounds kind of like the apocalypse right uh, yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> the world is ending yeah but uh uh really i mean i, I think i i don't understand the physics of it but okay. essentially what it was as i experienced it was uh, like uh, two or three days of like uh, a lot of uh, very cold uh, temperatures and a lot of snow oh, okay and so yeah you know you get snow up to like your like almost like till your knee sometimes uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> fun lots of fun <laughs> and and how how long did you spend in michigan uh six years in total mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, the, the so maybe maybe we should get into the difference here because the Yeah, PhDs in the US are very different from yes, else. from Europe at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I uh, I mean, so basically, how that works there is you go at least. So there's a lot of variation. Mm-hmm. I should say. Uh, okay. I'm just describing like uh, ecology, evolution, and maybe biology in general. But uh, and mm-hmm. there's variation across departments and universities and this and that. But how it works there is you go in, and um, you have already talked to some. advisor essentially but from beforehand and mm-hmm. so you have an advisor assigned usually in ecology at least uh, okay. when you come in yeah and then you do one to two years of coursework and this is something i really wanted to do actually because i didn't really have formal training in ecology because yeah. uh, i had one course and i had and in my sort of broad biology thing mm-hmm. and i'd done some research but i never had like taken courses in like yeah evolutionary biology and in uh, quantitative genetics and whatever else you oh, know that's helpful then yeah right yeah right. exactly so i i that, that's sort of why i wanted to go to the us mm-hmm. yeah, also uh nice. because uh, uh yeah so i did like one and a half years of coursework mm-hmm. and then you take your comprehensive exams at some point mm-hmm. uh which is so some th- Yeah, they're just like master's exams, or they are. Um, uh, I don't know what you mean by master's exams. Actually, oh, okay. so okay. I'll I'll just describe them to you, and then you can tell me yeah. what they are. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
how it works is you uh, essentially there a uh, means of trying to test whether or not you are ready to do the research uh oh, yes. and like that you have or rather that you have the knowledge yeah that you need to do the research oh i see that's at least that's the the purpose in principle mm-hmm. of the exams and the exam the nature of the exam can vary d- depending on the department and the university and this and that like yeah. some people will do um oral exams uh, mm-hmm. like so uh committee of four people will grill you um and ask you questions uh, for like 2 to 3 hours fun uh yeah <laughs> yeah uh, some people will do written exams some people will do um like uh i had once heard of like uh, someone doing like uh, like giving a student being given like okay a, a field which is completely different from the research field and being asked to like uh summarize it over a week and then come up with like the most important questions and mm-hmm. one experiment to like uh answer how you, you will answer this question so yeah you know there is variation yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so that and then when you take the exam and then uh what i did was i did a 3 hour uh oral exam with uh my committee and then after that i uh did a a, a proposal a research proposal for my phd mm-hmm. and defended it basically in front of the committee okay and yeah and then after that you do research for um whatever uh three, anywhere between uh uh three to four years yeah uh, okay and because it takes you like up to two years to get to the exam mm-hmm. at least yeah. sometimes three yeah and uh, so five to six years is sort of the and and then you also do teaching right in in the us as well yes always, yeah Yeah so you have to teach and there's a teaching requirement right and okay and often times a lot of people actually end up teaching a lot mm-hmm. um and i uh, didn't have to but luckily uh, enough but um essentially so there is a requirement that you have to teach at least some amount mm-hmm. but um that is often the one of the primary sources of income uh for grad students oh you get paid, paid. extra No well uh, not extra that's the only source of income a lot of times uh, oh uh, oh shit okay so i mean uh, no, i mean so okay <laughs> i should explain this better so basically there is uh, typically uh, there are as far broadly there are three uh, types of income sources for a grad student in the us mm-hmm. if you're doing a phd at least mm-hmm. there is one is you get a fellowship okay and that's just a lump sum of money that someone gives to you sometimes it's the nsf whatever national science foundation of the us or some private foundation someone yeah. is yeah. giving you x amount of money mm-hmm. please take this go do research <laughs> right <laughs> that is number one okay number two is uh, a research assistantship mm-hmm. which is essentially when your advisor or someone really doesn't necessarily have to be your advisor some mm-hmm. faculty member who uh, will get a grant mm-hmm. uh, that they wrote from uh, uh, I don't know NSF or somewhere else. Yeah, and then they would have uh, they would employ you on mm-hmm. that grant to work twenty hours a week oh. on their on on the grant, right? Okay. And do research for them. Mm-hmm. So that is how that's that's that. And then in the and I mean sometimes maybe if your research is the same as that grant, mm. then uh, I mean that then, then you can just do full time work on that, or you do twenty hours of this and twenty hours of that. Mm. That's that's the idea at least. Okay, and then. uh finally uh there is the teaching assistantships mm-hmm. uh which is the tas and that's where you are assisting a professor mm-hmm. in uh, teaching a class trying to i mean having maybe holding tutorials helping students solve problems grading assignments that sort of stuff mm-hmm. and sometimes even taking lectures if the professor is not there maybe or something like that yeah you know so and um so and then you get paid for that and that's also technically at least it's supposed to be 20 hours a week mm-hmm. and uh, and that's and then in the other 20 hours you do research okay so those are the three sort of broad yeah. and and which one did you have so i did a mixture of um so i had i had actually a mixture of all three honestly but most of the times i was an ra uh, which is a uh, research assistant so okay. i was also an international student which makes things a little bit complicated yeah because uh, not a lot of fellowships are available uh, you know you're not eligible for a lot of fellowships nothing from the us government for example mm-hmm. if you are uh, not uh, american citizen mm-hmm. and um then so i and i was lucky enough that my advisor had uh some grant money so that uh, mm-hmm. that worked out yeah all oh, right okay yeah so and, so and then i taught a little bit in between yeah. yeah and and do you like teaching or yeah i did i mean uh, i <laughs> <laughs> i did uh i didn't teach a whole lot but uh i from whatever little i did yeah uh, i did like teaching i mean it's uh, 
uh, it's a whole different challenge yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> trying to particularly like trying to explain math to like biologists can be <laughs> oh yes oh man <laughs> <laughs> i know uh, i i imagine you you yeah you have encountered this um, well uh, f- from the receiving end i'm i'm yeah. the idiot on the other side who doesn't understand it <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's not really your fault really i mean like this is the system how i mean yeah a lot of people haven't done you know like Uh, any math since like i don't know high school yeah exactly right yeah, yeah. so and suddenly you put them and you're like okay oh look there's a derivative <laughs> they weird symbols and like yeah. and it's, it looks like uh, gibberish to them yeah and yes. then you have to try and convince them that okay this is actually relevant to the biology that you're doing yeah exactly that's a, that's the biggest part is like right. as yeah. as soon as i get the relevance yes. then it's like ah Yeah. the door is open exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so that moment is very interesting to to watch that when, <laughs> when they finally get it and like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and now you're doing some some mentoring right oh so. yeah well yeah we just started actually um, okay. uh right. with uh, helmet uh, uh we have a student who is uh, collecting some data for meta analysis but okay. uh, uh yeah we just started so i haven't yeah. really gotten into it but yeah right did That's, you have to teach much maths yet Or? No, no, okay. no, no. Uh, so he's not. Uh, maybe later, but right now his project is not gonna get into that. Okay. So, All right. So far, not yet. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> yeah. So far, easy. Yeah. But the, uh, so, and uh, when did you get to the US? Twenty fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. And yeah. then six years. Uh, yeah. Twenty twenty one. I yeah. left. Oh, and then straight into the into the postdoc here. Yes. Right. Yes. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, yeah. I was applying basically all of my last year of my PhD. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. And I mean, yeah. That's where I ended up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I remember when you um, because we have these, I, I guess, like open application processes where uh-huh. where like you you presented your project oh, or your project yeah. idea to all of us yes, yes. and and we, i mean we didn't get to vote but uh-huh. i i still remember your project it sounded so great and like <laughs> super engaging uh, presentation so oh, you yeah? definitely yeah you definitely have a hand for for sci-com <laughs> oh, yeah. science communication oh that's excellent that's great to hear because yeah, yeah i i remember doing that presentation and uh, yeah it was i had to like pack a lot of stuff into like 15 minutes which is yeah it was awesome i loved it okay yeah. it's really good and <laughs> yeah yeah you, so you have some uh, science communication uh, experience you, you did some uh, blog writing contest oh yeah right uh, <laughs> that's not yeah i mean it wasn't anything big it was just uh, um, essentially at uh, the university there was at michigan state uh, where i did yeah. my phd um, yeah. there was a sicom sort of group essentially people mm-hmm. who were interested in sicom uh, yeah. and uh, trying to promote uh, science communication among people Uh, doing work there so they ha- they had a blog on which they would regularly like invite people to post stuff and mm-hmm. um, um yeah and um, so that t- to train them essentially right yeah and yeah so they had a small competition for which they were like uh, accepting pitches mm-hmm. and uh, it was uh, about the time uh, uh, covid had just hit yeah and uh, and then there were models everywhere yeah and exactly yes. so many models yeah. suddenly everywhere yeah and, exactly and, uh, i remember that yeah right and then everyone's everyone was doing projections right and, yeah yes uh, <laughs> everybody in that dog exactly <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh let's it seems to have somehow subsided now i don't know uh, yeah ma- it's not as at least it's not as uh, this thing now uh, yeah, exactly. popular but yeah yeah they don't need the projections anymore exactly now <laughs> <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah so uh, i i mean i am not an epidemiologist i should qualify i yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but here's the thing i mean the basic models of uh, uh, that the very basic models at least that uh, are used in epidemiology mm-hmm. are uh, sort of fairly similar to what we use in community ecology mm-hmm. um i mean i was basically i wrote a small piece saying uh, uh, explaining well one what models are mm-hmm. and sort of generally how they work and what are the caveats and how you should think about them yeah because i mean you know if you're if you're not familiar with any of this and then you you 
see like a prediction and then you're like oh my god this is reality yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> it might be very very far from reality I, i think that's super helpful though like like super valuable especially at that time because i remember like my my friends going nuts about models and all that shit yeah. but not understanding it and i'm trying to explain it but i also couldn't really right. describe it very well i, yeah. I, I would have needed that piece <laughs> <laughs> yeah well <laughs> yeah so that's uh, that's that's what i was trying to do and yeah, uh, yeah and i wrote uh, i i yeah i wrote a small piece uh, nice uh, uh, and talking about that and how you should deal with that yeah perfect mm -hmm. so definitely one of the of the mathematicians who apply their knowledge and make it broadly available <laughs> i mean yeah that's the hope at least yeah 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 Yeah, I think you're doing a great job of it, for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And then looking looking through your publication output, I've I've seen some super interesting stuff. So on on you you worked on snow leopards for a bit. Oh boy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, that paper still has to come out. I mean, yeah, we still have to finish it. Um, okay. But uh, the what happened was that. I was in India and uh, this is right before I came for my PhD and I had more or less finished my uh, master's thesis stuff mm -hmm. and uh, my advisor then uh, was a field ecologist primarily mm -hmm. and he uh, and some lab work but he worked with one of the, his uh, areas of study was like uh, these snow leopards in um, uh, the north the mountains the himalayas essentially mm -hmm. of, of india yeah. and uh, they <laughs> i mean uh, that's what i think he i don't really remember now but i think he did some of his like phd his phd and some maybe your postdoc i don't remember at some point he did work on that mm. but now he mostly works in the area on like uh, the plants and like the the nutrient cycles and stuff like that okay but he's still sort of uh, involved in that area mm -hmm. so um we were just coming up with like a small model to um because there's a there's a classic conflict which is the wildlife the wildlife conflict which is there everywhere where there is wildlife and there are humans yeah which is essentially you know you have a these this wildlife and then it sometimes comes into contact with humans mm -hmm. and it can vary from different places uh, so like um there what happens in the snow leopards cases they come out uh, they come in i mean uh, into the uh, there's a bunch of farmers who live around there and and they'll come in and sometimes they eat livestock mm -hmm. and uh, of course that doesn't please the farmers <laughs> not always no <laughs> <laughs> so then sometimes they will i mean uh, retaliate or do something like that right and okay. um, which is not great for the snow leopard right and what basically shoot them Or, I think yeah. so. I don't actually remember. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, try and like kill them somehow. Yeah. Or trap them. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, but the idea is that. So how, what do you do then? Because you want to conserve, mm -hmm. but you also don't want to. I mean, remove the people. The people yeah, are yeah. important, right? The, yes. For the conservation. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were like trying to look at like different. uh incentives and at this point i don't even remember the results <laughs> but um <laughs> but there are different incentives that you can do like uh you can pay them money um mm -hmm. uh, for x amount of money for the livestock damage that happened yeah right uh, or you can sort of incentivize uh maybe i don't know fence building or something like that so that their livestock are protected and they don't care uh, mm -hmm. as much or like you can show them that actually the through like uh these ecological dynamics uh for example uh the uh i'm trying to remember exactly what this was so essentially yeah. uh <laughs> this has been a long time uh basically the snow leopards keep in control the the herbivores mm -hmm. and then it's like classic trophic chain so basically you uh, snow leopards keep in control the herbivore populations mm -hmm. and the herbivores which means that the plants can sort of grow more and then there is also um uh this loop where uh these snow leopards will um uh, their excreta like they 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 poop basically yep. and then <laughs> some uh through the and and basically all of these dynamics when you combine them and i don't remember the exact details of this now mm -hmm. but uh uh you can sort of try and show that sometimes that will actually help uh increase the amount of nitrogen in the soil mm -hmm. as opposed to when the snow leopards not there yeah so which is uh to help make a case that the i mean maybe and more nitrogen means better fertilizers um, for um, better uh, the better soil better soil better agri agriculture so on and so forth mm -hmm. so the idea was to sort of make a simple model to try and see uh 
Um, so all these parameters, sorry, all, yeah. all, all these parameters were in the model. Uh, so uh, yes, so, to some extent. So basically, uh, there was a, the model itself was just uh, economic value of the livestock and how that impacts, mm -hmm. uh, like sort of the farmer uh, farmer action, and then uh, some uh, basic population dynamics of the small leopard, I think. And, mm -hmm. Right, and then there was some. Uh, ec uh, we were trying to run the model into different scenarios where they're like, okay, what if we incentivize um, livestock uh, versus yeah. what if we incentivize um, the wild population? So there's also the wild populations of their normal prey, by the way, which I completely forgot to talk about. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I got that at least yeah. with, with like the herbivores. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the natural herbivores and then there's the livestock yeah. and then there is the, the, the predator, which is yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's the three things. In yeah, one. now we got it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we were trying to see what these scenarios would entail and mm -hmm. what would that mean for uh, for the snow leopard conservation. Interesting. Yeah. So, so making a case for coexistence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sweet. But uh, human wildlife coexistence. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Um, do, do you know when it comes out? The paper? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, the, I I don't know honestly. Like uh, we have to like uh, get back on it. It's uh, after but due to all this PhD and like yeah. talk stuff. It's been sort of uh, it was a side project to begin with. Okay. And we did, I mean honestly we did the I, I remember we did all the model analysis and all the uh, it's just the writing which is left actually and mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where it gets stuck. All <laughs> you know? oh, right. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> I am very happy running code, but after that you have someone has to like you know have to like write an introduction and discussion oh, yes. and yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where I am. I get lazy. Ah, okay. Yeah. But yeah. Th that's understandable though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but hopefully soon. Hold on. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it okay. for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we get, oh, we, we, yeah, we're at the 40 minute mark now. Oh, okay. Oh it, yeah. Um, is there anything that we've missed? Anything you want to highlight? Anything you want to mention? Ah, as wow. a uh, conclusion? I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, no, I think that we've covered pretty much everything, really. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. All the research and, yeah, everything else. Yep. Then thank you very much for, for coming here and, and talking to me. It's been super interesting. Of and course. And to, to finally meet a mathematician who does it, <laughs> <laughs> who, who oh thinks broader. Okay, yeah, well, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. And this was lots of fun. Yeah, and, oh, uh, same. Looking forward to when this comes out. Yes, yep. for sure. Yep. Thank All you. Bye-bye, right. yeah. everyone. Want to dive deeper? Surf over to hifmb.de or follow us on Twitter at hifmb underscore ol.